Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our weekly seminar, MIT Category Seminar. Today, we have David Jess Myers from Johns Hopkins, who's going to talk about paradigms of composition. So I beg everybody who has a question to please write them in the chat of any of the channels you're connecting with, or raise your hand if you're on Zoom. And uh, without further introduction, please, David, go ahead. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm David. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking to you about what I like to call uh, paradigms of composition. So the idea is to build a setting in which to do categorical systems theory. And so um, this is a work in progress. So I will notate parts that are in progress with a little heart. Um, so that little pink heart will say that this is this is in progress. Um, but I hope to, to show you that, um, that, that some technology here, namely doubly indexed categories, um, are a really great setting in which to do categorical systems theory. So categorical systems theory is the study of dynamical systems and presentations of them uh, using categorical methods. So uh, a dynamical system could be many different things. It could be a system of differential equations. It could be a deterministic automaton. It could be a circuit diagram. That would be maybe more like a presentation of a system, a circuit diagram. It could be a um, Markov process. It could be, well, there's so many different things in every different field. And, and we'll, we'll see a few more on, uh, on the next slide. Um, and what to use categorical methods means is, uh, is really that what we're interested in is studying the composition of systems. And so in categorical systems theory, we study how systems are composed. So here are some examples of how we might compose systems. Um, on the first one here, we have a system of two differential equations. We might think of R as being a population of rabbits. We might think of F as being a population of foxes. And we see that the rabbits are born at a rate A and die at a rate B. The foxes are born at a rate C and die at a rate D. And we can couple these systems together. We can compose them by setting the death rate of rabbits to be proportional to the population of foxes, supposing that foxes eat the rabbits. And we can set the birth rate of foxes to be proportional to the population of rabbits, with the idea being that the more uh, rabbits the foxes have to eat, the more babies they can support. Um, and so this uh, composition can be expressed by this wiring diagram, which I've drawn in the middle there. And so at the end, we get this coupled system, and that's the Latka Volterra predator prey model. Um, we can also do uh, circuits. We can compose circuits, and we can compose circuits together by plugging them into each other. So here's a simple example where We've taken these two circuits, they're very simple circuits, they just have a little resistors and dangling wires maybe. And by uh, plugging them in, in a certain way, we can get a new circuit. And uh, I've given for good measure another example, another similar example of that, where we have this say population flow graph and we have the various different places the population can be flowing between and if we have multiple of them, we can glue them together. We can say, well, this place is really that place and this place is that place. And so we can get a big map. If you have a bunch of local maps, you can get a big map and look how population flows over the whole thing. Now, what we're really interested in when we study composition of systems is how these systems behave and how the behaviors of the systems can be calculated if you compose them. So how can you put together the behaviors of systems when you compose them, and much more difficultly, if you know a system is a composite, what can you learn about its behaviors by studying the behaviors of its, of its components? And so that will turn into a certain kind of functoriality. And so this is, uh, this is what we are interested in in categorical systems theory. And uh, so I might ask if we're interested in systems and how to compose them, then what is a system? Um, and how do we compose them? The answer is that everyone uh, and their uncle has a definition of system. 
So depending on what you do and what you're interested in modeling and what you're interested in designing, you'll tailor make a notion of system which is good for the kind of situations you have at hand. So every discipline has a different notion of dynamical system. So for example, we might by system, we might mean a system of differential equations. This is basically the bread and butter. Um, everyone uses differential equations. But we might also have, uh, we might also use more machines. These are used in computer science and circuit design. Um, they're also known as deterministic automata, or at least deterministic automata are a special case of, of more machines. And these are sort of circuit design from a high level. So it's not about the electrical engineering aspects, it's more about the logical aspects of circuit design. Um, or we could meet a Markov decision process. And a Markov decision process, um, you imagine that there's an agent and it has a state. And when it takes an action, it will transition stochastically to some other state. Um, and it, it may be oriented in the environment in a certain way. It may output certain information back into its environment. So all of these systems are composed by setting their parameters according to some variable or some function of the states of other systems. So for example, when we set the system of differential equations, what we do is we take the parameters, the free parameters in our differential equations, and we can set them according to the variables, the state variables, which appear on the left-hand side of other systems. And so that's what we did with the previous lopko volterra predator prey model is we took our parameters, namely the death rate of rabbits and the birth rate of foxes, and we set them according to the state, namely the population of rabbits, and the population of foxes. Um, with more machines, they have an input, they take an input symbol, they update their state, and then they release an output symbol. And so we can compose these by setting the parameter input symbol according to the output symbol of some other machine. And for a Markov decision process, we can imagine a multi-agent system where the actions of some agents can be set, at least in part, as a function of the way that other agents are oriented in their environment. There's also another example, which is a circuit. So a circuit or a circuit diagram is a way of presenting a certain uh, dynamical system, namely this electromagnetic dynamical system. Um, we could take uh, also population flow graphs. I like to call them population flow graphs. They're often also called Markov processes. Um, by this, what I mean is it's a matrix where all the non-diagonal entries are positive and they represent the outflows. And the diagonal entries are the negative sum of all the other ones in that column. And so there, that says that the total outflow out of a node is given by the sum of all things flowing from it to all other nodes. And so these are also known as infinitesimal stochastic matrices. And that's the relationship they have to the st stochastic Markov processes. But I don't wanna to get too far into that, it's confusing. There's a, basically, there's too many things called Markov processes, so I decided to call these population flow graphs. And also lab labeled transition systems. These are just graphs where some of the edges are labeled. We imagine that they tell you when you can transition from one state to another. And we can compose all of these things by taking some exposed ports. Say maybe we imagine that a circuit has some dangling wires or it's a box and outside of the box are some wires coming out or some, some plugs we might plug into. And we can plug them into each other. Or for the population flow graph, we have different places and population flowing between them, rates of flow of population. And we can compose these by saying that two places are going to be equal. So we like paste the graphs together. And similarly for labeled transition systems, we can do the same. We can paste the graphs together. Now another example is what I've uh, called here a Willem style type of behaviors. And so uh, if you uh, are familiar with uh, Willem's uh, behavioral approach to control theory, this is sort of what I mean. And I'll come back to this later, what I more precisely mean is a uh, Schultz and Spivak behavior type. And this is a type of behaviors of some system. It's understood as say behaviors taking place over time. Um, and it's very abstract. And uh, so the way we compose these is we say that if you have some behavior of some system and you wanna, you wanna set it, you expose some variables of it. 
So the classic example in control theory is that you have a plant and it has certain behaviors and we expose some variables. Say we, we know that we want the, the variable is the amount of, uh, of gunk flowing through this pipe. And what we want is to be able to control the amount of gunk flowing through this pipe. So what we need to do is set certain other variables of the system, maybe the amount of gunk flowing into that pipe, so that that can happen. And so that kind of setting is given by sharing variables. Um, and there are two other examples of these where sharing variables happen, which are Hamiltonian systems and Lagrangian systems. In this case, they can be composed by sharing variables. So if you imagine you have some, some physical system, let's say a spring, maybe you have two springs. If you have the end of one spring that has a position, that's one of your variables, and the start of the other spring has a position, that's another variable. If these variables are shared, that means that the springs are hooked up together, and now you have a coupled system. And so the reason these are work in progress is, I'll, I'll, I'll come to that later, is because of, uh, of some, uh, some minor uh, pullback issues uh, with these, uh, these, you can't take pullbacks of manifolds. Um, but I'll talk about that in a little bit. So, so these things on the right, these clusters, these three clusters, what I've given you here is a very strong rule of threes here. I'm giving you three examples of paradigm and then three more examples of what I will call a doctrine. These three clusters of how you compose, that's what I'm going to be calling a paradigm of composition. So a paradigm of composition will be a general idea of what it means to compose systems. So here are the three I'm going to look at um, in this talk. Uh, they're what I call the parameter setting paradigm, and that's when you set parameters according to variables of state. There's the port plugging paradigm, and that's when you, you compose systems by gluing them together, plugging in ports. And then there's the variable sharing paradigm, where you compose systems by saying that they share certain variables. Now on the left-hand side, each one of these items is what I will call a doctrine in their respective paradigm. So we'll have, say, the doctrine of differential equations in the parameter setting paradigm. And these are more specifically what it means to be a system given that we know how to compose systems. And, uh, and so I have many examples, examples here. So one thing I might, I might say is that um, this, uh, this uh, approach here is in some senses an applied higher category theory. I'm doing uh, two categorical level things. And uh, John Baez has a, has a nice quote, I believe it's John Baez, um, where he says that if category theory is the field of mathematics where your examples need examples, then higher category theory, in particular two category theory, is the field of mathematics where your examples need examples, which themselves need examples. And so I have three examples of a paradigm, and in each of those examples of a paradigm, I have three examples of a doctrine within that paradigm. And then, of course, there are many examples of systems within those doctrines. But uh, one from there. Okay, so. Uh, David, there uh, may yes. be some questions you may want to look at. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, can we compose systems with unequal number of inputs and outputs? Um, you, uh, I, will, I will come into exactly how we compose systems, but the way we're going to compose systems is going to be um, by giving a composition pattern. So the answer is yes, we can compose systems with unequal numbers of inputs and outputs as long as we say this input goes to that output and so on. And in fact, um, throughout all of this, my systems will not have inputs and outputs. I will say that they have interfaces and uh, um, except for, I guess, the parameter setting one does have inputs and outputs, but it's not necessary that, uh, that systems have inputs and outputs. Um, and to answer uh, uh, David's question, um, the, what, what Sophie calls research sharers are much more like uh, variable sharers. Um, so, uh, uh, but what so Sophie calls resource sharing machines is not a uh, doctrine in any one of these paradigms. It sort of sits halfway between a parameter setting and a variable sharing paradigm. 
Um, and uh, I, I can talk about that more at the end um, with uh, in directions. So are there any questions on the, on the gist of this idea, like what I'm setting out to give a formal definition of? All right, so continuing on, here's my abstract nonsense definition. And what we're gonna do for the rest of the talk is sort of work back around to understanding this. So what I will call a paradigm of composition is a lax monoidal two functor from some two category I will call the doctrines in that paradigm into the two category of doubly indexed categories. And I'll uh, explain what a doubly indexed category is in a moment. And that two functor is going to take each doctrine and give us a doubly indexed category of systems in that doctrine. So here are our three paradigms, parameter setting, port plugging, and variable sharing, written as these two functors. So the two category of doctrine, so a doctrine in the parameter setting paradigm will be an indexed category with a section. I'm not going to talk too much about parameter setting. If you saw my talk at ACT 2020, that entire talk was actually about constructing this two functor. So it was about constructing this paradigm. And, uh, and what happened was I used a technical uh, key piece there, which is what I call the vertical slice construction. And as it turned out that these other paradigms can all be constructed by using the vertical slice construction. So that's when I realized like, oh, I, I, have, I had already done all the work to get all these other paradigms. And that's when I started thinking about other ways of, of organizing things. So what I call a doctrine in that talk, if you've seen that talk, is what here would be called a doctrine in the parameter setting paradigm. And now I have other sorts of doctrines depending on your paradigm of composition. So the port plugging paradigm, its doctrine is going to be a finitely co-complete category with a chosen point. And I will explain why these, why these are the case and why these make sense. And the variable sharing one will be a finitely complete category. And so uh, I want to talk a bit about that heart sitting over lax monoidal. That heart signifies a work in progress. And what is a work in progress here is I'm not quite sure the exact formal definition I want to take for a paradigm of composition in full generality. I know that my, my definitions here will work um, for the main reason that those, those two, the top and bottom one, parameter setting and variable sharing, well, they're Cartesian. So they're going to be lax monoidal no matter what kind of technical nonsense I have to put for that. If, if you know that two category theory, there's a little bit of uh, extra wiggle room for what exactly you mean by these things. Um, the middle one would be Cartesian. However, uh, in practice, you like to restrict the, the boundary of your systems a little bit and it no longer is Cartesian. So in fact, everything here really comes from the fact that it's Cartesian and comes from universal properties and is therefore going to be lax monoidal no matter what exactly that means. But the, the formal, complete, rigorous definition of a paradigm of composition is work to be done when I see uh, what exactly properties I might want in the abstract. And in fact, a, a, a main takeaway of this talk is that what's really interesting is the, the fact that these systems form doubly indexed categories. Paradigms are just uniform ways of constructing and organizing these, these doubly indexed categories of systems. So, say that. So, um, so the Cartesianness uh, and the monoidalness are really only there because we need to be able to consider um, systems independently so that we can uh, consider them independently and then wire them up or, or compose them. Um, and I'm not going to talk about monoidalness for the rest of this talk for the purposes of time, um, but this is lurking underneath is really we want to do everything with this monoidal structure. And if we have this lax monoidal two functor or in particular Cartesian two functor and something nice like that, then the preservation of monoidal things is, is, comes for free. And that's really why it's all there. Okay, so now I want to explain why doubly indexed categories are interesting. And in particular, I want to ask the question, what is the algebra of composing systems? So we might say that a category is the algebra of composing functions. So my question is going to be, what is the algebra of composing systems? So here's a first pass at this idea. Suppose we have some category of interfaces or boundaries ways that our systems can interface with their environment. And the morphisms in this category are composition patterns. So on the left here, you can see I have these two interfaces up top. 
And then on the bottom, I have an, an interface. And I have in between this morphism, and this morphism is a way that I can compose the, the two inner interfaces to fill out the outer interface. So this is how I can compose things. And now the algebra of composing systems will be that, well, I'm gonna suppose that for every um, interface, I have a set of systems with that given interface. And then for every composition pattern, I'm going to give a function and that function is going to take my set of sy my system with that interface and compose them together to get a new system with the new interface. And, uh, and so um, if you're familiar with the operatic idea, uh, I'll just say for one final time that I'm skipping over all the monoidal stuff, really what we're thinking of here is an algebra for an operad, um, but it will turn out, it turns out to be much easier to construct things using monoidal stuff and then it's also, for reasons of time, I'm not gonna mention anymore the monoidal stuff. So if you're used to uh, these ideas of algebras of wiring diagrams, uh, algebras for operats of wiring diagrams, this is the same idea. So this is a great, um, a great pass at the algebra of composing systems, but there's one issue with it. And the issue is that it misses out on the maps between systems. So we really want to have these maps between systems because maps are great ways of studying objects and we want to study the systems. But so naively, one thing we might think of doing is like, okay, I said, send it every interface to the set of systems with that interface. Why don't I send it to the category of systems with that interface? And that would work except for there's an issue, which is what if we have two systems with two different interfaces? and we wanna talk about maps between them. Well, if we just assign every sys interface to a category of, of systems with, with that interface and maps which preserve that interface, then there's no way to get maps between two systems with two different interfaces. And so what we're gonna need here is two different kinds of composition. We have compositions of systems and compositions of maps. And for that reason, we're gonna be using double categories which I will assume you're familiar with. So this leads us to the definition of a doubly indexed category. Um, so a doubly indexed category is, uh, for those who know, a unital lax double functor into the double category of categories, functors, and bimodules, or profunctors. So what that means explicitly is that we're going to have, so this is, uh, this is what the doubly indexed category of systems in a paradigm P in a doctrine D in that paradigm will be. We'll have this double category of interfaces and to every interface, which is an object there, we'll associate the category of systems with that interface and whose maps are the maps of systems that preserve the interface or, or act identically on the interface. And then for every composition pattern, we'll have that be a vertical morphism in our double category of interfaces. And we'll send that to the functor that composes the systems according to that composition pattern. Now, the new thing we're adding here is that we're gonna add maps of interfaces. And so in the example of these bubbles here, a map of interfaces might be a function, which assigns uh, each like of these ports poking out of these bubbles, another port. And then what we do is we assign that to a bimodule of maps of systems. And those maps have to act exactly like that function on interfaces. So we have a map between the interfaces and then we assign it to a bimodule, which takes two systems in and it, that, and it gives us a set. And the set it gives us will be the maps between those two systems that act exactly like our, our given map on the interfaces. And finally, a square in this double category will be a compatibility of maps with composition patterns. It will be a, a specific way that maps, that these maps are compatible with these composition patterns. And what we get from that is going to be a transformation. And this transformation will compose the maps of systems according to the composition patterns. And I emphasize that this is not composition as maps, this is composition sort of as systems. So in other words, if we have a system, X, a system with interface X1 and, a, uh, and we compose it to a system with interface Y1, and similarly, we have a system with interface X2, we can compose it to a system with interface Y2, 
and we have a map between the system with interface x1 and x2, which acts on the boundary as f1, and we have a compatibility between f1 and f2, then we can get a map on systems that acts exactly as f2 on the interfaces. So that's what this says. So let me make this concrete as quickly as possible. Um, but before I do that, let me tell you uh, one way to produce these, which will be so important, which is the vertical slice construction. So the vertical slice construction is going to take a double functor and it's going to give us a doubly indexed category. And all of our doubly indexed categories are going to be created through this construction. So um, what it's going to do is it's going to take a double functor going from D0 to D1, and it's going to give us a doubly indexed category indexed by D1. And so what that's going to do is we're going to take an object of D1, and we're going to give it the uh, category whose objects are these vertical maps FA into D, um, where A is from D0, and whose morphisms are these squares of this special sort. And to any vertical, we're going to give the functor that composes vertically. To any horizontal in D1, we're going to give it the bimodule, which associates to any two objects in, um, in the, as you can see, the slice over D, to um, the, uh, the set of all uh, pairs consisting of a map in D0, a horizontal in D0, and a square of this form in D1. And finally, to a, uh, to a square in D1, we're going to give the natural transformation, which is given by vertical composition. Oh, and the laxness of the, um, of the, the, of the double functor, so the doubling index category is actually lax, and that one is actually composition, horizontal composition. Okay, so there's a theorem, which is that this is a product preserving, aka a Cartesian two functor, from double functors to doubly indexed categories. And the, uh, I've done this for the strict things and it's work in progress for pseudo things. I don't expect any difficulties here. I just, uh, you know, you just have to do the, the diagrams get significantly bigger and you just have to spend a little more time on them. But this, because this is product preserving, if we can give a product preserving or a suitably nice way of, pr pr uh, of producing double functors, we can just take the slice and that will give us a doubly indexed category. And that's how our paradigms are all going to work. So for now, we get to our example and an example of an example. So our first example paradigm will be the port plugging paradigm. And uh, what a doctrine in the port plugging paradigm will be is a pair consisting of a finitely co-complete category of quote unquote systems. And we might think of this as quote unquote closed systems. And we'll pick an object in that category, which we call the port. And so uh, an example of this example is uh, uh, following a uh, compositional framework for passive linear networks by uh, Bias and Fong. We can define uh, the category of circuits to be graphs who's e who have edge labeled in uh, non-negative real numbers. And we could think of these as circuits of linear resistors and we let P be the single node. And then, uh, so that's an example of what these systems might be, and I'll come to some other examples later. And what we're gonna have to do is take this thing, take this doctrine, and produce a doubly indexed category of systems. So we're going to be giving a way of taking a finitely co-complete category with a given point in it, uh, called the port, and we're going to produce a, I'm sorry, take, yeah, and produce a doubly indexed category of quote unquote systems. And it will be a, it will have interfaces, the cospans of finite sets. So let's see how this work. Here's the definition. We're gonna take the boundaries here, the interfaces are gonna be cospans of finite sets. So what that means is a boundary is going to be a finite set and we'll think of it as a finite set of ports. And then what we'll do is we'll take um, we'll take the disjoint union over that finite set of ports, right? And then we'll take the slice construction of this double functor, the inclusion of the empty uh, space, the empty uh, system into the double category of cospans of systems. And what that means is to the 
the category of systems with a given boundary, which is a finite set of ports, will be this, uh, this here, these, um, these morphisms of cospans. But the top of that morphism of cospans is, is set to be the initial object. So it doesn't really matter. And we can see that what it is, is going to be a system with boundary is going to be an object of our category C together with a B, um, a, a function picking out B many ports in it, where its interface is B, the finite set. So as an example in circuits, here's some examples. We have B is a two element set. And here are two examples of circuits. And we can see that what we're doing is we're picking out these boundaries on it. So we've uh, selected these boundaries. Our port is just a single point. And, uh, and I've given an example of a morphism here. And a morphism here has to preserve the boundaries. So are there any questions on this, on this, on this, uh, on this way of going. We started with our paradigm is giving us a way of taking a doctrine, which is a finitely co-complete category with a chosen object called the port, and producing a doubly indexed category of quote unquote systems. A system or an open system for emphasis. A system whose boundary is a given finite set is going to be an object with that set many ports selected in it, which we call the boundary. Okay, so now we can compose systems. So a wiring, I'm sorry, a composition pattern in this paradigm will be a co-span of finite sets. And what we're going to do with that co-span of finite sets is we're going to take the push out. And that's going to glue together our systems. So in the bottom here, you can see that we have this, um, these two uh, systems here, we have a three element boundary, a two element boundary. So in total, that's a five element boundary. And we're producing a one element boundary thing. And what we're going to do is use this, um, this co-span of finite sets to do it. And so co-spans of finite sets can be drawn as these little bubble diagrams. If you're interested in seeing more about that, you can check out the paper here, um, Hypergraph Categories by Fong and Spivak. And so if I zoom in here, you can see that the uh, co-span on the left is the boundary of the inner uh, systems so that we're going to compose. And it's all the ports there. So these are the ports of them. And what the co-span says is it says every one of those inner ones is going to get hooked up to a middle node. And every one of the outer ones there is going to get hooked up to an inner node as well. And what we're going to end up doing is gluing all the things that are connected to the same inner nodes. So let me try and get back to the perfect size here. There we go. OK. Um, so are there any questions about, about this uh, way of doing things? I'll give um, some more examples in a moment. Okay, so here are some other examples of port plugging doctrines. So we could take population flow graphs, uh, also known as continuous time Markov processes, um, as, uh, as uh, done in these two papers. So we'll take them to be Markov processes and the coarse graining maps between them, as done for coarse graining open Markov processes by Bias and Courser. And this works very much in the way of the um, uh, of the sort of decorated or structured co-span approach to um, composing systems, which you'll see here. So, um, so uh, this works very much like the, the, the ways you see to compose Markov processes in a compositional framework for Markov processes by Bias, Fong, and Pollard. And uh, the one main difference between uh, the port plugging paradigm and, and the sort of structured or decorated co-span approach is that uh, that the port plugging, the paradigm approach does, is the composition is unbiased. We don't assume that there's inputs and outputs. We just have uh, boundaries of the systems. And then we say, every time we want to compose them, we give the composition pattern we want in particular. Um, so uh, uh, another example of port plugging paradigms, we could take reaction networks, also known as Petri nets. And this is another thing from the bias school, a compositional framework for reaction networks by Byers and Pollard. And there they give a category of Petri nets 
and we can take, again, the, the port to be the single point. And we can also do labeled transition systems. And uh, if we have a graph of labels, we just slice the graph category over this. That takes labeled graphs. And if we have a port, we choose a particular label called our port label. And this will be our labeled transition systems um, composing. And there are variants on this uh, paradigm. For example, I could use multi-sorted ports. Um, so if I wanted different types of ports and I only wanted to glue in ports of the same sort um, and, and so on. So go on and say, uh, are, there any, are there any questions about the port plugging doctrine? I'll go on. So the next doctrine I'm going to talk, uh, the next paradigm I'm going to talk about is the variable sharing paradigm. Um, and my example here will be behavior types. So a doctrine for the variable sharing paradigm is a finitely complete category, quote unquote, of systems. Um, but this time we'll think of these as maybe more like the behaviors of systems collected together. And so as an example, following temporal type theory by Schultz and Spivak, we can take our uh, doctrine to be the, the topos B of behavior types. And if you don't know what that is, you can think of sets here. That'll be fine. Behavior types are a topos of sheaves on a uh, category of intervals and inclusions of, of intervals, but, uh, different ways of putting an interval into another interval. Um, and that uh, allows you to talk about um, behaviors that take place over time. But if you think of just set, then you'll get the, the essential idea of this, of this thing here. And so um, for a doctrine in the variable sharing paradigm, um, we are going to define our double Ely index category of systems here to be um, the slice construction applied to the double functor, which picks out the terminal object of uh, spans in our doctrine, in our finitely complete category. So what that means is that an interface for our system will be an object, and we can think of this as the object of uh, this, the type of exposed variables. And then a behavior in that will be one span, but the, the top leg of the span is going to be the terminal object. So it's really just a map and it's going to be a map from an object in our, in our category C into our, uh, our interface V. And we can think of as this as the exposed variable. So it's a, it's a, it's a map, so it's, it's a variable element. We can think of it as the exposed variable of this system. And so, um, so for an example, uh, suppose that our, uh, our exposed variable sort is the real numbers, and we can consider a system uh, to be, say, all, uh, we have three variables in this system and they satisfy the constraint that they lie on the unit sphere. Um, and we'll expose the X variable here. And uh, so that, that might be an example of a system, right? We have, some, we have some variables of our system, they satisfy some constraints that relate them, and then we'll choose some of that, uh, those variables to be exposed. Now, another thing I want to, uh, uh, sh uh, show here is that another example of a system, which is a special case here, is actually um, constraints. So here we might take the, uh, we have a single variable x, but we've said that its absolute value is less than or equal to one. And so uh, that we can think of as a constraint. So it is a system in this, in this doctrine, in this paradigm. However, we can think of it as a constraint. And then a map, which is just a commuting, uh, a, a commuting triangle like this, we can think of as saying that we have a satisfaction of this constraint. So here we have the variable, the fact that there's a map up there says that the variable X satisfies the extra constraint that its absolute value is always at most one. And so if, you, if you're interested in, in, in what you can use these things for, um, there, there are these two great papers, Dynamic, Dynamical Systems and Cheese by uh, Schultz Bivek and Basila Coppolo. And uh, the, the very recent, uh, uh, paper, uh, Compositional Sheaf Theoretic Framework for Event-Based Systems by Bar Zardini, Spivak, Sensi, and Frazzoli. And uh, so that was just presented at uh, ACT 2020. 
And so those papers tell you what you can do with these systems. And in fact, what they, they use uh, a fact that you can end up interpreting the behaviors of a lot of other different kinds of systems into this setting. And so I'll, I'll come back to this. Behavior types are in some sense, variable sharing on behavior types is in some sense a nice big tent. Um, if you wanted one doctrine and one paradigm, that's a nice big tent. And I'll come back to that when I talk about uh, functoriality behaviors. Um, so uh, how do you uh, actually share variables? Here's an example of how you actually share variables. What it's going to be here is a composition pattern is a span. And you will compose your systems by taking pullback. So in practice, so let's suppose you have some rainfall model and it has some variables V1 and it exposes all, it exposes some variables I don't care about called V1. And also it exposes the outflow, the amount of outflowing rainwater. And suppose you also have an overland flow model of how rainwater flows over your land and it has uh, an exposed variable, which is the inflow. So what we can do is we can, we might want to set the inflow to be equal to the outflow. So if we have two separate models. Maybe they were constructed by two separate teams doing two separate kinds of like methods. And we want to make a combined model that puts them together. Well, what we can do is take, here's our uh, composition pattern. And what we'll do is this is interpreted as this span at the bottom. And you can see that that span says that we have over here all of our variables. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take, uh, we're going to select from that, we're going to see, uh, excuse me, on the left leg, what we're going to do is we're going to take only those things which are the same on both of those R, those R's have to be both the same. Right, so we're sharing the variable by saying they're both the same. So we're setting inflow to outflow. And then on the right, we're just projecting out the middle one because we're hiding it. We're saying we no longer is this part of our exposed variables. It's an internal variable now. And then so when we compose, what we're gonna be doing here is taking the pullback. That's just gonna take the behaviors of both of these things that satisfy this extra constraint that the outflow of one equals the inflow of the other. So this is just plugging in our equations if you have a system of equations. And if you're wondering why I've used the same sort of diagram here as I have in the port plugging um, paradigm, the answer is because just like in the port plugging where we restrict, we could do a similar trick here. But instead of restricting to co-spans of finite sets, we'll be restricting to spans of finite sets op. And if you think about that for a bit, you'll notice that those are co-spans of finite sets. The difference is that the double category is slightly different. Um, the maps for cospans of finite sets, they have to underline maps of systems that operate on places. So they end up being just functions going in the same direction. But in spans of finite set ops, what we're doing is we're taking variables and all, uh, the, the finite set is our finite set of variables. And a map here is, a, is an opposite in the finite set. What it is is a selection of variables. And uh, and so you could do that. I, I'm not doing that. The reason is I want to have more, uh, if I'm doing that, I'm restricting what kinds, of, uh, what kinds of functions I allow on my systems, but that's okay. You're always free to restrict uh, later afterwards. You don't have to do everything on the paradigmatic level. Um, but this is a very nice level to set the paradigm. So are there any questions about, uh, about this, about variable sharing? All right, so uh, now um, uh, rolling in on the, on the end here, I wanna talk about doubly indexed functors and, and black boxing. So uh, yes, it's kind of cool that there are, that all of these different sorts of systems that have been studied by all sorts of different, different people um, form doubly indexed categories. Uh, an argument I'm trying to build in this talk is that doubly indexed categories are a very good uh, system to organize the, uh, the compositionality of systems in general. But what we really want to know is about behaviors. How do behaviors of systems compose? And so what I want to present here is that behaviors of systems, which are also known uh, colloquially as black boxings, where in, in other words, we hide the inner workings of the system and we just look at how they behave. Um, 
that those are well understood to be lax doubly indexed functors between these doubly indexed categories of systems. So a lax doubly indexed functor is going to consist of a double functor on the categories of the, the double categories of interfaces together with a lax vertical transformation of, of, of the given sort. And what that means is that we have these two kinds of uh, these two kinds of transformation here. So what the what the square on the left is with the natural transformation there, that says that if I if I so imagine that um, we'll imagine that f is going to take behaviors on interfaces, and f bar is going to be take behaviors of systems. And then so what what f bar uh, says is if we what this um, left square says and under lax vertical transformation is that if we take uh, some systems with an interface D, we take their behaviors and then we we you know uh, share variables according to the the composition pattern W the way that that uh, affects behaviors. Um, then, so in other words, this is a, a, uh, a, a bunch of behaviors for all our thing, all our systems that are compatible. So this is, that top composite is compatible behaviors. Then we can get a behavior of the entire composed system, which is the bottom we compose first and then we take behaviors. So that's why it's lax is that in general, you can only go one way. So in general, it's not necessarily the case that you can look at a, a composite system and know uh, exactly how it's behaving by looking at its parts. So in general, the, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. But um, in many cases, in fact, and, and more than you might think, um, it is actually, this, uh, this is actually an isomorphism. And in that case, we just drop the lax when we call it a doubly index functor. Um, so in those cases, you actually can reconstruct the behavior of a composite entirely terms of, in terms of the behavior of its parts. Um, and so the other thing here uh, is a transformation um, uh, of natural transformations. And what this says is that if I have a map between systems, uh, then I get an induced map on behaviors. So we can push forward behaviors by maps of systems. That's what it says. And that these, of course, have to satisfy a litany of laws. Um, so uh, here's one example of this. I'll have some more examples later. Um, one example is the Euler method. So I haven't talked about uh, I haven't talked about this uh, paradigm. This is all working in the parameter setting paradigm, and we restrict uh, our interfaces just to be wiring diagrams, which I haven't told you about. But they're the sort of squarish looking diagrams I was using to compose the dynamical the differential equations at the start. And this one will take differential equations and give us a discrete time differentiable systems. It's an approximation um, that, that takes a differential continuous time system and gives us a discrete time system um, for, for a given jump uh, of epsilon greater than zero. And another example, which is very useful, is behaviors or trajectories. So if we have our differential equations, we can take it, we get a doubly indexed functor, which goes into this. Uh, Remember the variable sharing systems for behavior types here. It produces a behavior type, and our behavior type of, uh, of our wiring diagram here has these ports. And what we're going to do is take, um, assume that each port is carrying a real number variable for simplicity. And we're going to take a differential equation and we're going to set it to the set of trajectories. So our behavior will be the trajectories, the solutions to that differential equation. And so uh, <clears throat> if you look at the uh, Schultz Spivak uh, et al way of using these behavior types, you see that a lot of cases, the examples of them are generated in this way. So what this uh, double, functori double index functoriality says is a bunch of compositionality results there. So um, one nice thing is that uh, here's a way to produce them. We have a representability thing. So I'll make this sort of temporary definition I'm going to define a double category to be Spanish for lack or in spite of a better name. Um, and uh, it will be Spanish if every parade representable from D to span is pseudo. And the reason I'm calling it Spanish is because it's sort of like a category of spans. If you take this property here, what, it, what this says is a, is a vertical uh, factorization property. 
So what that says is if you have an object and you're mapping into a vertical composite with a square into a vertical composite, you can uniquely factor that into a composite of two vertical squares. And if you write that down in the double category of spans, you'll see that that's exactly the universal property of the pullback. So what this is really saying is that composition in this, in this uh, vertical composition has a sort of pullback-like universal property. And so uh, this is a, uh, you don't have to remember this definition too hard. The point is, uh, in fact, you don't have to remember it after this slide. Um, the point is that the parameter setting and variable sharing paradigms, their interface double categories are always Spanish. And there's a theorem which says that if you have a Spanish double category and you have an index category, uh, uh, index, doubly index category A on it, and you have any system S, I'll call it S, any object S in A of D, then there is a representable lax doubly index functor of the following sort. And it goes into spans of sets and slice of spans of sets over. And I'll notice that uh, I'll note that the, that that the the codomain doubly index category here is uh, the systems in the variable sharing paradigm of set. So this is in a way how how do you get these um these behaviors of systems as variable sharers? Well, often it comes from these representables. And uh, again, this is work in progress. I have it done for strict ones. Um, pseudo just needs a little more work because of coherence. Um, so uh, here are the takeaways and, uh, and future directions. So the main takeaway of this, of this talk will be that uh, doubly indexed categories are a useful and good algebra for composing systems and the maps between them together. And uh, paradigms of composition, the definition I gave, uh, what they are is uniform and fairly straightforward ways to produce these doubly indexed categories. So once you have the paradigm, to produce one of these categories, doubly indexed categories is quite easy. For example, to produce a port plugging paradigm of which there are many and many more that we'll be interested in, all you have to do is find your category of closed systems and prove that it has push-ups um, and an initial object then you're done. The work has been done for you. Um, and it's not done in a very complicated way. In fact, most of the work, except for the vertical slice construction, is off the shelf. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's uh, too functorial. And what that will mean is that uh, if you have a finitely uh, finite co-limit preserving functor, you get a doubly index functor. I don't have a specific example of this being used, but I imagine that, that it's not too crazy to find some of these. Um, and so uh, one direction, I, I will be writing these directions with this pink arrow for, this, for these two slides. So one direction would be more examples of doctrine. So one thing I really think uh, uh, I would really like to get, and I'm quite close to getting, are these Hamiltonian and Lagrangian systems um, as variable sharing doctrines. Um, so these are, are, are done in uh, open systems in classical mechanics by uh, Baez, uh, Weisbart, and Yassin. And um, so they, uh, they work by uh, composing via uh, pullback over spans, just in the way of a variable sharing thing. But they don't fit into the very general framework I put here, because um, the categories there are in are categories of manifolds. They're not finitely complete. Manifolds don't have all, all limits. Um, and so in this paper, what the authors do is they do some kind of, uh, they do some kind of um, you know, tricks to work around that and they come up with a new notion of span and uh, that works even though you can't actually take pullbacks and stuff. And I haven't been able to roll that in, but my imagination is that either what you could do is expand those categories to some nicer categories that do have pullbacks, um, so, such as, you know, as, as they do in synthetic differential geometry or diffeological spaces, or, um, and then it would become a variable sharing paradigm, or you make a new paradigm which adds the extra data they need in order to make these spans that don't really, that aren't really composed by pullback. Um, so they're, they're almost there, I expect them to work. And there are plenty of other doctrines I haven't talked about in the, in the uh, especially in the parameter setting paradigm. I have a lot of examples here. Um, so here, down here is a picture of some paradigms. So one nice thing is about having this definition is once you have it, you can just compose, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a two functor. You can compose two functors. 
So here are sort of restrictions of paradigms giving you different notions of systems. So we start, all of them factor through uh, the vertical slice construction here. So all of, or, or I say factor through, but really I should say use, because after you, uh, you do this, sometimes you restrict the interfaces a little more to get them to be more diagrammatic and less uh, semantic, but they all sort of factor through this vertical slice construction. And so here we have finitely co-complete categories with a point. Um, we take this, uh, the inclusion of the, uh, of the initial object into co-span, that's what we call the port plugging. If we take finitely complete categories with a, uh, uh, the inclusion of the um, terminal object into span, that's what we call variable sharing. Um, I didn't talk about this, but if you go and uh, see my slides from uh, my uh, uh, ACT 2020 talk, what I talked about there was this one. Um, if we have an index category with a section and we take the, the, the double functor to be the horizontal inclusion of the base of that category uh, together with that section going into the uh, Grothendieck double construction, which is something I talked about there, um, then that is what I, I've, I've been calling the parameter setting paradigm. And then we can sort of, if, if we have two functorial ways of producing uh, these doctrines, then we can restrict these paradigms further. So for example, uh, labeled graphs or labeled transition systems, right? I could see that as a paradigm in its own right. And its doctrine will be the one category of graphs. And we can uh, produce two functorially a finitely co-complete category by slicing over this and pushing forward labels. Um, also, uh, there are a number of ways to produce parameter setting systems um, that, uh, uh, that I would like to work out more in full. So uh, uh, Jeff Crutwell pointed out to me that if you have any tangent category with display maps, you can produce what I've, uh, uh, a doctrine for the parameter setting paradigm. And uh, uh, the trick is just um, doing, so uh, I know, I know the, the things I've written here with the direction arrow, I know on objects work. Um, I just haven't found the right two category to put them in. In fact, I actually know um, some of them on functors, but still not, uh, I'm not sure what the right two morphisms are. Um, and you can also take monadic or non-deterministic automata where your non-deterministic is handled by a monad, a commutative monad. Um, and you can take uh, discrete time dynamical systems um, here by taking any Cartesian category and taking this sort of uh, co clasley construction, doing, getting lenses and taking these lens-based systems. That gives you uh, more machines. And so these are all paradigms. And, and you just sort of like, once you, have the, once you have the idea of how to produce these, now you can produce all of them like, all, you know, quite well. Once you have a little machine, you can just run the machine. So the other takeaway I want to say is that doubly indexed functors are really great ways of organizing compositionality results for, especially for black boxing results. So doubly indexed functors include um, some approximations such as the Euler method and the uh, runga kutta method. And I want to really highlight here uh, compositionality of the runga kutta method by uh, Timothy and Ngotiako. I'm sorry. I actually practiced this, and of course I messed it up at the time. Um, I apologize, Timothy, for, for mispronouncing your name at the, at the crucial moment. Um, but I want to really highlight this paper, because this is uh, independently, um, and before uh, what, uh, how I got into doubly indexed categories, this constructs the doubly indexed categories of, dynamo, of differential equations and another doubly indexed category that works sort of like a in the, uh, that works like in the variable sharing doctrine and, and gives the runga kutta method as a monoidal doubly index functor between them. Um, without, without doing this sort of uh, abstract framework, it actually fits right in. And it was already done before I got into this uh, paradigms of composition thing. So I, I wanna really highlight that. It's a, it's a great paper. Um, uh, so other examples include uh, behaviors. Um, uh, which include uh, trajectories, steady states, and periodic orbits. These are things I talked about at uh, ACT 2020. Um, and these are all re representable. So uh, I mentioned the, the representable uh, W index functors. These are all representable. In fact, the ones I've listed there are not even lax. They're actually uh, pseudo representable ones. And uh, you, it's easy to find lax ones though. So instead of periodic orbits, if you want um, periodic looking trajectories, for example, or uh, instead of steady states, you want steady trajectories. So those are any trajectory, but on the exposed variables, it's, it's steady. Um, then those are lax. 
And the reason is that if you have a composed system, it might be steady on its exposed variables, but its internal parts might be, their exposed variables might be changing arbitrarily. And so uh, that's an example of something, of a, of a behavior on the whole thing, which is not uh, given by behaviors on components. Um, and a work in progress is the master equation, which should take uh, population flow graphs, also known as uh, Markov processes, and give you a differential equation. And what's fun about this is, um, I believe that this will be a lax doubly index functor. Um, I should say that uh, it, it, we have to use a restricted double category of interfaces instead of co-spans of finite sets. I actually like it more for the port plugging paradigm in general, but it's a little more complicated to describe, so I didn't describe it here. Um, but if you're interested, you can ask me about it. Um, and uh, and uh, so this is uh, uh, partly checked. I just need to go and, and finish checking. Um, but I'm fairly confident in, in this one is going to work. And what's nice about this is um, that if you have this, uh, you can compose it. So we have all these things that go outside of uh, differential equations, like say the runga kata method, right? And now we can get a uh, functoriality of applying the runga kata method to a uh, Markov process, right? um, where your composition is now given by a composition of Markov processes. So that's pretty cool. So I want to make a quote unquote conjecture here. And my quote unquote conjecture is that every black boxing gives rise to a lax, possibly lax doubly index functor. And I, I think that, so this could be a real conjecture if I l restrict this to every black boxing functor which currently appears in the literature. And I believe that that will be true. It should be true because all you should be doing is just rearranging the lemmas that people have already proven about compositionality. So this, is, uh, this should be just another way to organize it. But as I've showed that uh, using representables um, and using uh, other ways of constructing these doubly index functors that you can get some of these behavior black boxing things without sort of doing them by hand, that there's, uh, there's, um, there was ways that, that don't do it by hand. And in fact, um, uh, by two functoriality, a map of doctrines induces a doubly indexed functor. And, uh, and that, is, uh, that is actually how I get the Euler method approximation. And uh, you can get other ones like that, I believe, as well. So there's a, there's a lot to do here. So, so uh, in conclusion, there's, there's just so much to explore. And I, I hope that this has uh, whetted your interest and that, that you find the, these, uh, these way of organizing the, um, some of the thoughts in, in categorical systems theory useful. And uh, I would love to work um, with, with, with anyone on more and more aspects of this, of this, uh, of this program. Uh, thank you for your attention. Wow, very nice. Thanks a lot for the talk. Very nice and unified. Very good. Um, okay, are there any questions about any of the topics, any comments that anybody wants to make? Uh, if you do, please write in the chat or raise your hand. Okay, David have a quest, has a question. Uh, you can unmute yourself. Okay. Um, hey, uh, thanks for the talk, David. Um, so if I have one of these doubly indexed categories, like the one in Timothy's paper, is that right? He, he gives a doubly indexed category. Then, then I automatically get a paradigm with one object, with a doctrine, with one, op, with one doctrine that gives me that thing, right? Uh, like there's a yes. paradigm with one object whose, do, with, whose single doctrine is a one object a, category. A minoritally, <laughs> a, min, a minoritally doubly indexed category you can see as its own single paradigm, which is, uh, which is right. like, yeah, it's, um, it's saying that the only thing I, my, your paradigm, your doctrine is this one doctrine, right? A paradigm so, is just a sort of collection of doctrines. And what you've said is I want one doctrine. Right. So if I have Timothy's paper and I think, oh, cool, I want to use David's idea here, then would I think to, would I, would I have some idea of like how to generalize the doctrine? Do I get some sense just from looking at what he does say of, and this is a very non-mathematical question, just kind of like the pursuit of math. And I'm looking at this thing and I say, I want to generalize this. How would you recommend realizing that this is just one knob among many, one doctrine among many? So I would start by focusing in on the double category of interfaces. So, um, uh, uh, 
Timothy's um, category of double category of interfaces um, is very slightly different from the one I was using. It's uh, slightly restricted. Um, I do not believe that restriction is necessary. Um, but if you looked at that, um, you might be able to uh, uh, it, it, you might be able to um, figure out like what you what you want. What is right? what this he's is actually you using? What, what is and he then, actually using? Yeah. Yeah. What things are you actually using? And mm -hmm. so it's sort of by, by looking at, um, so how, how I worked to the other two pair. So I, I sort of, without knowing what a paradigm was, I built a paradigm. That was my parameter setting one. And then I, I was like, well, you know, it's, it's a shame to miss out on all these other ways of composing systems. Um, and so the way I reverse engineered like the, the structured co-span one into the port plugging paradigm was by sort of, you know, looking at what, what do we need here? Well, we need to be able to take push outs. And it turned out that that was it. That, that, that's <laughs> so, um, um, cool. And, okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So, so hopefully it's also not as, uh, it's not, um, it's actually quite a work, a bit of off the shelf work to that help that can help you build these, um, which is what I was using. And that's, what's sort of very nice. Great. Thanks. So any more questions or comments by anyone? All right, it seems that there are none. So for now, let's move the discussion offline. And well, thanks again, David, for a very nice talk. Thanks, everyone.